1980, the year Blondie topped the pop charts with Call Me and British Leyland introduced the Mini Metro. Flared trousers were no longer cool and men felt safe to cut their hair again. As the Formula One season starts, Jody Schechter in his Ferrari is world champion, but the team in the ascendancy is Williams. A record number of teams lined up for the new season thanks to the wide availability of the Cosworth engine. Only Ferrari, Renault and Alfa Romeo built their own engines, all the rest raced by courtesy of Ford. But the dominance of the 13-year-old Ford V8 was under threat. Renault's turbo had already won one Grand Prix, and the French were hungry for more. On January 27th, the teams and drivers gathered together at the Interlagos circuit in Brazil for race two in the championship. 1980's crop of drivers came from all over the world. Australian Alan Jones had already won the first race in Argentina. Bruno Giacomelli was in his second season for Alfa Romeo. An Italian driver in an Italian car was a source of national pride. From Germany came Jochen Mass in his second year with Arrows. Frenchman Patrick de Paillet had come to Alfa Romeo from Ligier. Canada's Gilles Villeneuve was in his fourth year at Ferrari, but Swede Stefan Johansson failed to qualify in the shadow and would not race again this year. Riccardo Patrese of Italy was in his fourth season with the Arrows team. Alain Prost was new at McLaren, coming straight from victory in the European Formula 3 Championship. Like Prost, Jacques Lafitte was French. They were two of seven French drivers who would compete in the 1980 Championship. Lafitte was driving a Ligier, one of two all-French teams on the grid. Brazilian Emerson Fittipaldi, twice world champion, was in his sixth season driving his own car. Another non-qualifier was Eddie Cheever of the United States, driving an Ocella. While Tyrrell's Derek Daly was from Ireland, and McLaren's John Watson was also from Ireland, this time from the north. Ferrari had won the Constructors' Championship in 1979, but the emphasis was switching from engine power to aerodynamics, and the team was lacking in this field. Still, it had the advantage of the mercurial Gilles Villeneuve, a naturally gifted and brave driver. The Lotus team had Elio De Angelis from Italy. Nelson Piquet of Brazil was the Brabham team leader. Following his team's switch to Ford power late in 1979, as the field lined up on the grid, he and Jones were seen as potential winners. In his first Grand Prix, Alain Prost was 13th on the grid. Nelson Piquet was 9th, and a disappointed John Watson was on the back row. Rene Arnoux in the powerful Renault turbo car was sixth. And Williams Carlos Reutemann of Argentina was well placed in fourth. With no planned pit stops, the cars were topped up with fuel on the grid. Villeneuve sits calmly in the Ferrari while his mechanics work around him. Ligier's Didier Peroni, another of the French contingent, pulls on his fireproof armour, ready to start from second on the grid. Villeneuve made a storming start, but it was no help, for he was to retire. Victory went to René Arnoux in the Renault, 
ahead of Elio De Angelis' Lotus. Alan Jones was third and maintained his lead in the championship. The next stop on the Grand Prix trail was the Kyalami circuit near Johannesburg in South Africa. With a win under their belts, the Renault team's spirits were high. The circuit's high too, 6,000 feet above sea level, and that's a plus for the French team. Their turbocharged engines will work better than the Fords and the Ferraris in the thinner air. Former champion Jackie Stewart can pass on a few tips to points leader Alan Jones. He'll need them, the Australian's eighth on the grid, but he's well ahead of Andretti's Lotus. Lafitte is better placed, the Ligier driver is fourth. But Emerson Fittipaldi is finding it hard going ten places further back, while teammate Keke Rosberg, in his first year with the Fittipaldi team, is on the back row. Daly and Jarrier in the Ford-powered Tyrrells are in the middle of the pack. And Switzerland's Clay Regazzoni is 20th. But this is all of little interest to Renault, whose cars are on the front row of the grid with Jean-Pierre Jaboui on pole. At the start, the Renault's turbochargers make the most of the thin air, and the two cars streak into the lead with Jaboui ahead. As the field accelerates through the dip in Kyle Army's home straight and heads into the first corner, the other cars look breathless behind the two yellow flyers. People said the French cars had as much as 90 horsepower more than the Cosworth here at Kyle Army, and it certainly looked that way. It only took a few laps for the two leaders to start catching the back markers. After just 14 laps, the reigning world champion Jody Schechter pulls into the pits gesturing to his engine. The Ferrari's race is over and prospects for Jody repeating his title already look bleak. Jones, who had even managed to lead the Renaults for a few moments early in the race, was their main challenger during the opening laps. But when he dropped back, Lafitte and the Ligier moved in to make it a trio of Frenchmen leading the race. Behind them, their challengers were dropping out. Villeneuve's transmission failed, while Jones's gearbox let him down. De Angelis, Cheever, Rosberg and Patrese all slid off the track, fortunately without hurting themselves. Derek Daly caught the crowd's attention when his rear tyre exploded right in front of the pits. After leading from the start, Jean-Pierre Jabouille's front tyre let go and he was forced to retire with just 16 laps to go. This left René Arnoux to take his second successive win, putting him ahead of Jones in the championship standings. Although he was number two in the team, the diminutive driver was the hero of the hour. Didier Pironi, who'd made steady progress through the field in his Ligier, took third behind his teammate Jacques Lafitte. three French drivers and three French cars in the top places, the only tune they could play was the Marseillaise and the only drink they could spray was champagne. Despite having his leg in plaster, former champion James Hunt was enjoying the sun at the US West Grand Prix. This was the fifth running of California's own Formula One race 
which was held on a temporary street circuit in Long Beach. It wasn't the driver's favourite track, but the sun was warm and the locals were friendly, so this was a popular stop on the championship trail. The Renaults would have no extra advantage here at sea level, so the Cosworth-powered cars such as Williams and McLaren were in a position to do well. James Hunt's broken leg was the result of a skiing accident. Downhill champions Ken Reid of Canada and Conrad Bartelski of Britain, who were in Long Beach as spectators, were probably telling him how to avoid doing it again. As the car set out for practice, there was one absentee. McLaren's new recruit Alain Prost had broken a bone in his wrist at Kyle Army and it was not yet healed. Young British driver Stephen South took his place for McLaren, but he failed to qualify. In 1978, Lotus introduced the aerodynamically efficient wing car. It changed the face of racing. Mario Andretti won the world championship that year, but during 1979, the rest of the manufacturers built their own wing cars, while Lotus made no progress. The 1979 car was scrapped and there was a new design for this year. But Mario and Lotus founder Colin Chapman still had much to do for other teams like Brabham under Bernie Eccleston had made further progress over the winter. In the days before centralised timing with TV screens in every pit, teams were responsible for timing their own drivers and the competition, constantly updating time charts that showed the current situation in the fight for grid position. Clay Regazzoni, dropped by Ferrari at the end of 1979, was now driving for British team Ensign. At Alfa Romeo, Bruno Giacomelli and Patrick De Paille were having a frustrating time, for the cars were plagued by small problems. There were no problems for famous team owner Rob Walker. He had retired and he was in Long Beach as a journalist recording the news about drivers like Jacques Lafitte for American magazine Road and Track. A team owner who was far from retirement was Ken Tyrrell. The man who had made Jackie Stewart a star could give drivers Derek Daly and Jean-Pierre Jarrier plenty of useful advice. Although he was based in Europe, Eddie Cheever was an American and was on his home ground here. Regular driver Mark Schurer was injured, so Jan Lammers from Holland was driving the ATS car. His fourth on the grid outshone established stars like Jochen Mass, who was only 17th. The race was dominated by Nelson Piquet, who'd taken Nicky Lauda's place in the Brabham team the year before. He started on pole and never lost the lead. The race was spoiled by accidents. They led to the retirement of six drivers, including Alan Jones, who was lying second when he was hit by Giacomelli. The worst accident occurred when Regazzoni's brakes failed at the end of the main straight. He crashed heavily and was seriously injured, forcing him to retire from racing. After the flag fell, Piquet celebrated his first Grand Prix win with fellow Brazilian Fittipaldi, who was third behind Ricardo Patrese. Piquet was now among the title contenders. From the sun of California, the circus headed to Europe and Belgium. The race was held at Zolder, a 2.6 mile man-made track in the Flemish part of the country. To remind the teams where they were, during practice it rained heavily and the rain tyres that had so far this season been unused came into play. There was another change on the tyre front at this race. The authorities had banned qualifying tyres, which gave maximum grip for just a lap or two. Now teams had to practice on the tyres they would use in the race. 
Fortunately, the weather was only bad during practice, and on race day the sun shone brightly as pole man Alan Jones settled into his car before moving off to the grid. The Williams cars were going well here, and Reutemann in the team's second entry was fourth fastest. Between the two Williams drivers was another team pairing, Pironi and Lafitte in the Ligiers. Behind them were the two Renaults, which had set exactly similar qualifying times. Less than a second covered all six. It looked like the battle was going to be between these drivers, but the management and drivers of the other teams weren't going to give up easily. The conditions for racing were now perfect, and as the start approached, the tension mounted. At the start, Pironi powered ahead of Jones, who held on to second place but had obviously been caught unawares. Lafitte was third, ahead of Reutemann, but the unlucky Jabouille covered only a lap before he went out with a clutch problem. Jabouille had now had mechanical failures in all four races, while Arnoux, who had inherited his fifth place, had won two of them and was leading the championship. Another driver who was out of luck was Jochen Maas. As the field came round on the second lap, he just tried too hard on the entry to the first turn. Fortunately, only his pride was bruised. Ten years before, Grand Prix cars had been slim cigars, with little or nothing in the way of wings. By 1980, a Formula One car was one big wing, shaped on its top and bottom surfaces to stick to the track. The best way to appreciate the look of the wing cars was from the front, where their width and the isolation of the driver in the middle of the aerodynamic pontoons on either side was most obvious. The effect of making the whole car into a wing showed up most in cornering speeds. The cars created such downforce in corners that the drivers were being subjected to gravitational forces previously only experienced by jet pilots. On some corners, forces of well over 2G were being imposed. Strain on the driver's neck muscles was becoming an occupational hazard. At the flag, it was the same as it had been on the first lap. Pironi scoring his first Grand Prix victory, ahead of Jones with Reutemann third. Arnoux was fourth from Jarrier on the very last lap, earning enough points to keep him two ahead of Jones in the championship. And so Formula One returned to its most glamorous venue, the Principality of Monaco. For most of the year, Grand Prix racing works hard to attract the rich and famous to visit the tracks where it sets up camp. Once a year, however, the Grand Prix is brought to them. The pits are cramped, the difficulties of operating 27 race cars and their attendant crews in a space bounded on one side by a bustling town and on the other a bustling harbour are almost overwhelming, but still the race is the most important in the Formula One calendar. Not because it's the greatest test of the cars or the drivers, but because this is the one that those who sign the sponsors' checks want to visit. A good weekend here, not necessarily on the track, can often ensure a budget for next year. Practice is always important, but this year, with 27 cars entered, it's even more crucial for the teams at the lower end of the Grand Prix pecking order. Because of the confined nature of the track, only 20 cars will be allowed to start, and the seven slowest qualifiers will not get their sponsors' names in front of the biggest TV audience of the season. 
for the top teams, practice is important. For those with fewer resources, it is vital. As usual, Williams and Ligier do well. Pironi's best time is good enough for pole ahead of Reutemann, who just outqualifies Jones. Piquet is next, followed by Lafitte, while Villeneuve is sixth in a Ferrari that has difficulty in fighting against the Cosworth-powered wing cars on high-speed circuits. On the twisting streets of the Principality, where speeds are lower and downforce is not as important, driving skill counts, and the little Canadian has plenty of that. Among those that don't qualify are Watson in the McLaren and Rosberg in the Fittipaldi. If they don't go home, maybe they'll watch from the balconies overlooking the Lowe's hairpin. Didier Pironi, however, will be working on Sunday afternoon. Monsieur Pironi's working day starts well, as he leads Jones, Reutemann, Lafitte, De Paillet and Piquet up the hill towards the heights of Monte Carlo. But behind the leading group, there's chaos on the saint de -Vote corner. Schechter, who started 15th, comes through ahead of Villeneuve, who was 6th. Behind the leading half-dozen cars, the whole pattern of the grid has changed. Derek Daly, starting from the 6th row of the grid in his Tyrrell, was too late on his brakes for the first corner. The over-enthusiastic Irishman ran over Giacomelli's Alpha and was thrown into the air. The flying Tyrrell took out teammate Jarrier, Prost McLaren and the Alpha. The only people left smiling were Italian electrical goods manufacturers Candy, the Tyrrell team's sponsors. These pictures were shown around the world. The budget was justified for all the wrong reasons. As the leaders were on their way past the harbour to start their second lap, the marshals worked to clear the debris from saint de -Vot. Pironi was still ahead of the two Williams cars and Lafitte, and this was the order that was maintained, with Pironi fighting to stay ahead of Jones and Reutemann holding off Lafitte, the Paillet and Piquet. It's notoriously difficult to overtake at Monaco, and the cars were so evenly matched that it would need something to break to change the order. And that's what happened. After 25 laps, Alan Jones came into the Williams pits. His race was over with a failed gearbox. A couple of laps after Jones retired, Schechter was in, complaining about the performance of his tyres. All the hopes of the Williams team were now settled on Reutemann, who hadn't won a race for two years, back when he was with the Ferrari team. But now was his chance, for on lap 54, Pironi spun into retirement, the victim of a broken gearbox. Despite rain that fell late in the race, the Argentinian driver maintained his lead, and at the end of 76 laps, he was over a minute ahead of Jacques Lafitte, with Nelson Piquet driving a safe and steady race to third. As Carlos and his wife Mimicha were sharing the celebrations with Prince Rainier and Princess Grace, the Williams team could celebrate, despite the setback to Alan Jones' championship hopes. The sun was shining and the Formula One circus was back on the Mediterranean, practicing at the Paul Ricard circuit for the French Grand Prix. The atmosphere within the sport, however, was not so sunny. Between Monaco and this race, the Spanish Grand Prix had been the scene of a showdown between the independent constructors on one side and the sport's governing body and the teams of the major car manufacturers on the other. 
There had been a race in Spain, but without the teams of Ferrari, Alfa Romeo and Renault. Alan Jones had won, but the International Automobile Federation had decided the race would not count for championship points. The man who led the independent teams was the Brabham boss, Bernie Eccleston, and this was one of the first steps on a path that would lead to his domination of the sport. But for the teams and drivers, it was a matter of business as usual as they tuned their cars to the French circuit and its long Mistral Strait, named for the wind that so often blew along it. There was a special atmosphere about the race, for there was every possibility that it could be won by a French driver in a French car, with the Ligiers and Renaults highly fancied. At McLaren, John Watson had abandoned the unusual two eyes helmet he'd worn so far this year for a normal pattern, but it wasn't making him faster than his talented young teammate Alain Prost. After injury problems earlier in the season, Prost was now settling into the team and he qualified on the fourth row of the grid. The combination of his speed and Watson's experience was a good one but the McLarens still couldn't compete with Williams and Ligier among the Cosworth runners. But there were moves afoot to change matters. Marlborough had plans to link McLaren with a Marlborough Formula 2 team run by Ron Dennis, and the sponsor's top man was at the circuit to look things over. Alfa Romeo, one of the great names of motor racing, was having its first full season in Formula One since 1951, but the team was making steady progress in a racing environment that had nothing in common with that of 30 years ago. In Dupaillet, they had a fast and intelligent driver who worked hard to explain himself in whichever language was required at the time. The team manager was Carlo Chitti, one of the great characters of Italian motor racing. Alfa's other driver was Bruno Giacomelli, who'd made his name with Alfa's sports car team. A former European Formula 2 champion, he'd been with the Alfa Grand Prix project since it first started in 1979. The car was powered by a normally aspirated V12 engine, but the factory was already working on a turbocharged unit. The Italians discussed tactics and technology, but the Alphas could only make the fifth row of the grid. Ahead of them, the chances of a home win looked good, with four French drivers in the first three rows. Lafitte was on pole, ahead of Arnoux, Veroni, Jones, Reutemann and Dubuis. Lafitte led from the start, with Peroni and Arnoux behind. The aerodynamics of the Ligiers and the power of the Renault were paying dividends. But as the race progressed, Jones, who had started fourth, began to make progress. Lafitte's grip on the lead looked solid, but Frank Williams and the crew could remain optimistic. On lap 35, the optimism was justified as Jones took over a lead he was to hold to the finish. 
The two Ligier drivers were second and third, and the French crowd invaded the track to congratulate them. There wasn't an Australian flag available, so Alan Jones got a Union flag to mark the Williams victory and his own success. Despite the fact that his Spanish win had been struck from the record, Jones was still leading the championship by three points. Although they were in the land of Champagne, the Williams team never sprayed it on the podium as a mark of respect to their Saudi Arabian sponsors. But even without an alcoholic shower, victory still tasted sweet. In the 70s and 80s, the British Grand Prix alternated between Silverstone and Brands Hatch. In 1980, the race was at Brands. John Watson takes us on a lap to see what a great Grand Prix track it was. We start at Clearways, the bend that brings us onto the start and finish straight, with the pits on the right. Then we approach Paddock Hill Bend, one of the most daunting corners in racing. Out of Paddock we plunge downhill and up Pilgrim's Rise, heading towards Druid's Hill Bend, another challenge because of the way the track drops away into the natural basin that makes brands so good for spectators. Along the short bottom straight, and then there's the fast climbing left-hander of South Bank Bend, which takes the cars off onto the long Grand Prix circuit. We're climbing all the time along here, heading up Hawthorne Hill, round Hawthorne Bend, and into the short Portobello Strait. Now we're heading into Westfield Corner. Then it's downhill again, through the right-handed Dingle Dell, and on into Stirling's a fast left-hander. Then there's another burst of speed along the straight that leads into Clearways and off onto another lap. team came to Brands Hatch with Alan Jones leading the World Championship standings and with Carlos Reutemann ready to give strong support in the quest for points in the Constructors' Championship. They were the team in the lead, but as practice progressed, it became clear that of all the teams here, the one that was really on form on this circuit was Ligier. The French team had been working hard to increase the downforce its cars produced, and there was no doubt that the combination of body shape and the sliding skirts at the outer edges of the body worked better for Ligier than for anyone else. All the teams were working with skirts which channeled the airflow under the car and allowed more control of the important aerodynamic effects created by the car's carefully shaped underside. But skirts were very much a reality this season and teams had to learn to live with the problems they posed such as an extra load on the brakes on this undulating circuit. For teams like Ferrari, whose wide flat 12 engine was difficult to build into a wing car design, banning skirts would be an advantage. For the Cosworth cars, however, like Ligier, who took the front row of the grid, and Williams, who took the second, wings and skirts were the key to success. And it showed as the field plunged through Paddock Hill Bend on the opening lap.
The Ligiers, led by Pironi, were stretching their lead as Watson brought his McLaren in for a tyre change. He continued, but the problems that put both Ligiers out were not with tyres, although both cars suffered tyre failures. The problem was with the wheels, which were cracking under the immense pressure put on them by the downforce. Williams had no such problems, with victory for Jones and a third place for Reuton. Between the two Williams drivers and maintaining his challenge on Jones for the championship was Nelson Piquet. The gap between him and Jones was six points and there were six rounds left. After Brands Hatch, the championship visited Hockenheim for the German Grand Prix, where Lafitte won in his Ligier, and the Austrian round at Zeltbeck, where Javoui won for Renault. There was tragedy too. The popular French driver Patrick Dupayet was killed while testing for Alfa Romeo in Germany. The next stop was Zandvoort in Holland, where Frank Williams and chief designer Patrick Head give us an insight into what goes on during practice. Did you come at the pits hard then on the brakes? Reasonably, yeah. Yeah, it's 393.60. Yeah. That's some information. We've got some information. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's fine as well. You've got fuel, right, exactly. You've got fuel for 10 laps. So when I give you the arrow, you must come in. Got that? That's it, yeah. Out on the circuit, the driver's on his own, but in the pits, he's part of the team. Every member of the team has a part to play, but the team manager must control everything, from keeping tabs on the weather to deciding when the driver should check out his spare car. And all the time, he must know how the opposition is doing. Car. No, we're going to go back to back with the other car oh, yeah. first, so you can have your car ready. I'll tell Ken how much gas to put in. Take your time. I'm giving him the arrow this lap. Right. Come out and go in the other car, Alan. Yeah? Yeah, I want you to try it. You've got plenty of time. Um, it's now seven. That was Carlos at 17.7, but now our new one, Qualys, has done 17.5, Javoui 17.9. Yes, yeah. Wind speed was an important factor at Zandvoort, where the long main straight ran parallel to the North Sea, and checking it was part of the timekeeper's job. Timing had by now gone electronic, but there was still no instant feed from the organizer's timing apparatus. Each team needed its own man on the watches, feeding the vital information to the managers and drivers even when the driver's stop was unscheduled, like this one, when Alan Jones needed an adjustment to the throttle. But even as the problem was being sorted, Frank Williams was thinking ahead, to race day tomorrow. We must do some running on full tanks, otherwise we haven't got any indication overnight of what the problem might be. If we, if we, if we get a major problem on full tanks tomorrow, like sort of solid steering or something, then we, uh, uh, after the morning warm-up, then we just have to take a punt right. on putting it right. But I'm having trouble getting gears. I'm having trouble going from second to third, and I'm having trouble going down the gears as well. Mm -hmm. It's gripping and I'm missing. Like once there, I had brake somebody. The reason I wanted to do that one extra lap is yes. I just got a toe off daily or something. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, see, I, I saw that, yeah. I have to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you never know. Uh, yeah, right, been, right. Know, might have just been enough. Uh, well, you don't, do you think you can handle whole five, or, or do you think that's going a bit? No, fuck it, let's try it. Yeah. Okay. You can handle it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Where's John? Did John go? Up? John, whole five on the rear wing. Gas, tyres, and wings. Gas, tyres, and wings. Three vital components in the job of putting together a quick practice lap, and at the same time checking every aspect of the car. The pressure is rising, and Alan Jones is showing it. Well, if we don't do it now, we're never going to another car. I think we ought to do it. We've got to do four tanks, Alan. Nobody's, nobody's going quickly. Alan, you, you really came, ought to do more laps. You've got to do more laps. It's 18 1 then, which Just was one quickest. Lap, 18 1, and then the end. I mean, you, you've got the car over still. Right now, everyone. Quicker and quicker, we've got to do the same. 
I put two and a half more gallons in. So you've got another seven or eight laps to go. That's all right, two and a half. Okay. At the end of practice, it all came together for the Williams team. Carlos Reutemann was the quicker of the two drivers and took third place on the grid. Alan Jones was alongside him on the second row, a mere one hundredth of a second slower. Ahead of the two Williams cars were the Renaults of René Arnoux and Jean-Pierre Jabouille. The gap between the first four was a mere blink of an eye. Arnoux on pole was less than four tenths of a second faster than Carlos Reutemann. Villeneuve was seventh, while championship challenger Piquet was fifth. At the start, Jones was superb. He passed Jabouille and then took his car around the outside of Arnoux on the famous Tarzan corner. From fourth on the grid, he was now in the lead. But as the field came round to start the second lap, the lead appealed off into the pits. Jones had gone wide on a corner and damaged one of his all-important skirts, and his chance was gone. With Jones at the back of the field, Nelson Piquet seized his chance, and by lap 12, he'd made his way into the lead. The young Brazilian had his second win of the season in his sights, and showing calmness and control, he took it, dealing with the cold temperatures and blustery winds in a manner worthy of a champion. As Piquet received the congratulations of his supporters, his face showed the pleasure of victory. Little did the young man know that in a career that would last for another 10 years, there would be 21 more wins to come. Lafitte looked set for second place on the podium, but almost on the last lap, Arnoux forced his way past. Reutemann was fourth, but poor Alan Jones was last man home in eleventh place. It was a setback to his championship hopes. Ever since 1950, the Italian Grand Prix had been held at Monza near Milan. But in 1980, it went to the new Dino Ferrari circuit at Imola, near Bologna, even closer to Ferrari's heartland. But there was little for the Tifosi to cheer this year. Ferrari was having a tough season. The problem was that the Italian giant was too cumbersome to respond to the challenge of the small specialist teams that have multiplied since Ford made the Cosworth V8 engine available for sale. The big manufacturers, like Renault and Ferrari, called the smaller teams garagists because they only needed small premises for their operations. But the garagists, free of expensive costs for engine development, were teaching the big boys how to do it. Cooper had shown the way by winning the World Championship in 1959. 21 years later, the specialists were dominating the sport. The sight of the Ferraris lagging in the practice times was frustrating for the Italian crowd, but it was to get worse. In Saturday's practice session, Jody Schechter slid off the track in spectacular fashion and destroyed his car against the barriers. He was unhurt, but his morale was damaged. World champion last year, this year he was being overshadowed by his young teammate. When Jody walked away from the car, he also walked away from the circuit without explaining himself to the team. He returned to race on Sunday, but at the end of the year, he would walk away from racing for good. There was one bright spot for the fans, however. Villeneuve tried out a new turbocharged engine in practice, and it was fast. It wasn't ready to race yet, but when the locals saw the Renaults first and second on the grid, at least they knew there was a turbocharger in Ferrari's future. 
British private entrant Rupert Keegan, campaigning one of last year's cars, meant that there were now three Williamses on the grid, but at the start, Keegan was back on the 11th row. At the front of the grid, Reutemann tried to make the most of an advantageous position to get past the two Renaults, but he couldn't. To make things worse, an indiscretion later in the lap put him back to dead last. Piquet was flying, however, and by lap three, he'd split the two French cars. The Brazilian had started alongside championship rival Jones on the third row, but he had left the Australian well behind in seventh place. With only four laps gone, Piquet moved into the lead. Villeneuve crashed and Giacomelli picked up a puncture from the debris, Jones was able to gain two places, but he couldn't catch the Brabham. Watson had been making steady progress through the field, but with a third of the race gone, he was out with a broken wheel bearing. Jabouille was chasing Piquet, and now Jones was up to third, working hard to bridge the gap to the Brazilian. On the pit wall, Frank Williams and Bernie Eccleston could only watch and keep their fingers crossed for their respective drivers. But there was encouragement for the Williams crew when Jones passed Jabouille and moved into second place. Throughout the second half of the race, Jones tried his hardest, but Piquet was uncatchable. As the finish approached, he'd pulled out a gap of almost half a minute over the Australian. As the flag fell, Nelson Piquet knew that he had taken the lead in the World Championship. But by finishing second, Alan Jones had minimised the gap between them to a single point. And the Williams team could be encouraged by the fact that Carlos Reutemann had made his way right through the field to finish third. The final two rounds of the championship took the circus across the Atlantic. Here in Montreal, Canada, the sun was bright but the temperatures were cool and autumnal as the car set out for practice. Piquet went on to take pole position ahead of Jones while Pironi's Ligier was third. Emerson Fittipaldi's team did well with Rosberg sixth and Alpha had Giacomelli fourth and new team member Andrea Di Cesaris eighth. The Renaults were not at home here, however, with Jabouille thirteenth and Arnu on the back row of the grid. All eyes were on the battle for the championship and the Brabham team was working hard for Nelson Piquet. The Brazilian had made great progress during the season, as had the car, thanks to the work of designer Gordon Murray. Naturally, Williams were working just as hard for Alan Jones, and with the two championship challenges on the front row of the grid, the start was going to be tense. It turned out to be too tense, in fact, for the two leaders touched, and in the melee that followed, a number of cars were damaged and the race had to be restarted. Piquet took his spare car and led initially, but broke down with two-thirds of the distance to run. Pironi took the lead, but he had an extra handicap. He was carrying a one-minute penalty for creeping at the start. Jones was lying second, and so long as he kept within a minute of the French driver, victory, and with Piquet's retirement the world title, was his. As the flag fell, he was well within the required distance. And to make the Williams team's success even more satisfying, Carlos Reutemann was inside the minute two, taking second place. The Argentinian's points helped ensure that Williams would win the Constructors' title for the first time after eight seasons in Formula One. Jones and his team had plenty to celebrate. On to the US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen, and there was a change at the head of the grid. 
For the first time, Alfa Romeo and Bruno Giacomelli took pole, and the Italian looked very comfortable in the lead. The team had made great progress during the season and had overcome the tragic loss of Patrick de Paillet to get up among the leaders. When Giacomelli dropped out with an electrical fault just after half distance, it was a great disappointment. Piquet had been running second to the Alfa ahead of the two Williams cars, but he dropped out after 24 laps, ending Brabham's season on a low note. Giacomelli's retirement left the two Williams cars first and second, with Jones ahead. He dropped down the field when he ran wide at the start, but he steadily climbed back, passing Reutemann to take second place just before Giacomelli retired. Reutemann stayed close, just four seconds behind at the finish, and Pironi was third. It was a great finish to a great season for the Williams team and its drivers, and it was the start of a decade in which Grand Prix racing would become more popular than ever before. <laughs>